The Myth of Air Socrates I will tell you a tale, not one of the tales which Odysseus tells to the hero Alcinous, yet this too is a tale of a hero, Air, the son of Armenius, a Pamphylian by birth. He was slain in battle, and ten days afterwards, when the bodies of the dead were taken up already in a state of corruption, his body was found unaffected by decay and carried away home to be buried. And on the twelfth day, as he was lying on the funeral pyre, he returned to life and told them what he had seen in the other world. He said that when his soul left the body, he went on a journey with a great company, and that they had come to a mysterious place at which there were two openings in the earth. They were near together, and over against them were two other openings in the heavens above. In the intermediate space, there were judges seated who commanded the just after they had given judgment on them and had bound their sentences in front of them to ascend by the heavenly way on the right hand, and in like manner the unjust were bidden by them to descend to the lower way on the left hand. These also bore the symbols of their deeds, but fastened on their backs. He drew near, and they told him that he was to be the messenger who would carry the report of the other world to men, and they bade him to hear all that was to be heard and seen in that place. Then he beheld and saw on one side the souls departing at either opening of heaven and earth, when sentence had been given on them, and at two other openings, other souls, some ascending out of the earth dusty and worn with travel, some descending out of heaven clean and bright. And arriving ever and anon, they seemed to have come from a long journey, and they went forth with gladness where they encamped, as at a festival. And those who knew one another embraced and conversed, the souls which came from the earth curiously inquiring about the things above, and the souls which came from heaven about the things beneath. And they told one another of what had happened by the way. Those from below, weeping and sorrowing at the remembrance of the things which they had endured and seen in their journey beneath the earth, now the journey lasted a thousand years. Those from above were describing heavenly delights and visions of inconceivable beauty. The story, Glaucon, would take too long to tell, but the sum was this. He said that for every wrong which they had done to anyone, they suffered tenfold, or once in a hundred years such being reckoned to be the length of a man's life, and the penalty being thus paid ten times in a thousand years. If, for example, there were any who had been the cause of many deaths, or had betrayed or enslaved cities or armies, or been guilty of any other evil behavior, for each and all of their offenses, they received punishment ten times over, and the rewards of beneficence and justice and holiness were in the same proportion. I need hardly repeat what he said concerning young children dying almost as soon as they were born. Of piety and impiety to gods and parents, and of murderers, there were retributions other and greater far which he described. He mentioned that he was present when one of the spirits asked another, Where is Ardeus the Great? Now, this Ardeus lived a thousand years before the time of Er. He had been a tyrant of some city of Pamphylia, 
and had murdered his aged father and his elder brother, and was said to have committed many other abominable crimes. The answer of the other spirit was, He comes not hither and will never come. And this, he said, was one of the dreadful sights which we ourselves witnessed. We were at the mouth of the cavern, and having completed all our experiences, were about to rescind when, all of a sudden, Ardeus appeared, and several others, most of whom were tyrants. And there were also beside the tyrants, private individuals, who had been great criminals. They were just, as they fancied, about to return to the upper world, but the mouth, instead of admitting them, gave a roar. Whenever any of these incurable sinners, or someone who had not sufficiently been punished, tried to ascend. And then, wild men of fiery aspect who were standing by and heard the sound seized and carried them off. Ardeus and others they bound head and foot and hand and threw them down and flayed them with scourges and dragged them along the road at the side, carting them on thorns like wool and declaring to the passers-by what had been their crimes and that they were being taken away to be cast into Tartarus. And of all the many terrors which they had endured, he said there was none like the terror which each of them felt at that moment, lest they should hear the voice, and when there was silence, one by one, they ascended with exceeding joy. These, said Er, were the penalties of retribution, and there were blessings as great. Now when the spirits which were in the meadow had tarried seven days, on the eighth they were obliged to proceed on their journey, and on the fourth day after, he said that they came to a place where they could see from above the line of light, straight as a column extending right through the whole of heaven and through the earth, in color resembling the rainbow only brighter and purer. Another day's journey brought them to the place, and there, in the midst of the light, they saw the ends of the chains of heaven let down from above. For this light is the belt of heaven, and holds together the circle of the universe, like the undergirders of a trireme. From these ends is extended the spindle of necessity, on which all the revolutions turn. The shaft and hook of this spindle are made of steel, and the whorl is made partly of steel and also partly of other metals. Now the whorl is in the form like the whorl used on earth, and the description of it implied that there is one large hollow whorl which is quite scooped out, and into this is fitted another lesser one, and another and another, and four others, making eight in all, like vessels which fit into one another. The whorls show their edges on the upper side, and on their lower side all together form one continuous whorl. This is pierced by the spindle, which is driven home through the center of the eighth. The first and outermost whorl has the rim broadest, and the seven inner worlds are narrower in the following proportions. The sixth is next to the first in size, the fourth next to the sixth, then comes the eighth, the seventh is fifth, the fifth is sixth, the third is the seventh, last and eighth comes the second. The largest of the fixed stars is spangled, and the seventh, or sun, is brightest. The eighth, or moon, colored by the reflected light of the seventh. The second and fifth, Saturn and Mercury, are in color like one another, and yellower than the preceding. The third, Venus, has the whitest light, and the fourth, Mars, is reddish. The sixth, Jupiter, 
is in whiteness second. Now the whole spindle has the same motion, but as the whole revolves in one direction, the seven inner circles move slowly in the other, and of these the swiftest is the eighth. Next in swiftness are the seventh, sixth, fifth, which move together, third in swiftness appeared to move according to the law of this reversed motion, the fourth. The third appeared fourth, and the second fifth. The spindle turns on the knees of necessity, and on the upper surface of each circle is a siren who goes round with them, hymning a single tone or note. The eight together form one harmony, and round about, at equal intervals, there is another band, three in number, each sitting upon her throne. These are the fates, daughters of necessity, who are clothed in white robes, and have chaplets upon their heads, Lachesis and Clotho and Atropos, who accompany with their voices the harmony of the sirens. Lachesis singing of the past, Clotho of the present, Atropos of the future. Clotho from time to time assisting with a touch of her right hand the revolution of the outer circle of the whirl or spindle, and Atropos with her left hand touching and guiding the inner ones, and Lachesis laying hold of either in turn, first with one hand and then with the other. When Air and the spirits arrived, their duty was to go at once to Lachesis, but first of all there came a prophet who arranged them in order. Then he took from the knees of Lachesis lots and samples of lives, and having mounted a high pulpit, spoke as follows. Hear the words of Lachesis, the daughter of necessity. Mortal souls, behold a new cycle of life and mortality. Your daimon will not be allotted to you, but you choose your daimon. And let him who draws the first lot have the first choice, and the life which he chooses shall be his destiny. Virtue is free, and as a man honors or dishonors her, he will have more or less of her. The responsibility is with the chooser. God is justified. When the interpreter had spoken thus, he scattered lots indifferently among them all, and each of them took up the lot which fell near him, all but Air himself. He was not allowed. Each as he took his lot perceived the number which he had obtained. Then the interpreter placed on the grounds before them the samples of lives. There were many more lives than the souls present, and they were of all sorts. They were lives of every animal and of man in every condition, and there were tyrannies among them, some lasting out the tyrant's life, others which broke off in the middle and came to an end in poverty and exile and beggary. And there were lives of famous men, some who were famous for their form and beauty, as well as for their strength and success in games, or again for their birth and the qualities of their ancestors, and some who were the reverse of famous for those opposite qualities, and of women likewise. There was not, however, any definite character there, because the soul, when choosing new life, must of necessity become different. But there was every other quality that all mingled with one another, and also with the elements of wealth and poverty, and disease and health, and there were mean states also. And here, my dear Glaucon, is the supreme peril of our human state, and therefore the utmost care should be taken. Let each one of us leave every other kind of knowledge, 
and seek and follow one thing only. If peradventure he may be able to learn, and may find someone who will make him able to learn and discern between good and evil, and so to choose always and everywhere the better life, as he has opportunity. He should consider the bearing of all these things which have been mentioned severally and collectively upon virtue. He should know what the effects of beauty is when combined with poverty or wealth in a particular soul, and what are the good and evil consequences of noble and humble birth, of private and public station, of strength and weakness, of cleverness and dullness, and of all the soul, and of the operation of them when conjoined. He will then look at the nature of the soul, and from the consideration of all these qualities, he will be able to determine which is the better and which is the worse, and so he will choose, giving the name of evil to the life which will make his soul more unjust, and good to the life which will make his soul more just. All else he will disregard. For we have seen and known that this is the best choice both in life and after death. A man must take with him into the world below an adamantine faith in truth and right, that there too he may be undazzled by the desire of wealth or any other allurements of evil, lest coming upon tyrannies and similar villainies he do irremediable wrongs to others and suffer yet worse himself. But let him know how to choose the mean and avoid the extremes on either side as far as possible, not only in this life, but in all to come. For this is the way of happiness. And according to the report of the messenger from the other world, this was what the prophet said at the time. Even for the last comer, if he chooses wisely and will live diligently, there is appointed a happy and not undesirable existence. Let not him who chooses first be careless, and let not the last despair. And when he had spoken, he who had the first choice came forward, and in a moment chose the greatest tyranny, his mind having been darkened by folly and sensuality. He had not thought out the whole matter before he chose, and did not at first sight perceive that he was fated, among other evils, to devour his own children. But when he had time to reflect, and saw what it was in the lot, he began to beat his breast and lament over his choice, forgetting the proclamation of the prophet. For instead of throwing the blame of his misfortune on himself, he accused chance and the gods and everything rather than himself. Now he was one of those who came from heaven, and in a former life had dwelt in a well-ordered state. But his virtue was a matter of habit only, and he had no philosophy. And it was true of others who were similarly overtaken that the greater number of them came from heaven, and therefore they had been schooled by trial, whereas the pilgrims who came from the earth, having themselves suffered and seen others suffer, were not in a hurry to choose. Owing to this experience of theirs, and also because the lot was a chance, many of the souls exchanged a good destiny for an evil, or an evil for a good. For if a man had always on his arrival in this world dedicated himself from the first to sound philosophy, and had been moderately fortunate in the number of the lot, he might, as the messenger reported, be happy there, and also his journey to another life and return to this, instead of being rough and underground, would be smooth and heavenly. Most curious, he said, was the spectacle sad and laughable and strange. For the choice of the souls was in most cases based on their experience of a previous life. 
There he saw the soul which had once been Orpheus, choosing the life of a swan out of enmity to the race of women, hating to be born of a woman because they had been his murderers. He beheld also the soul of Thamyrus choosing the life of a nightingale. Birds, on the other hand, like the swan and other musicians, wanting to be men. The soul which obtained the twentieth lot chose the life of a lion, and this was the soul of Ajax, the son of Telamon, who would not be a man, remembering the injustice which was done to him, the judgment about the arms. The next was Agamemnon, who took the life of an eagle, because, like Ajax, he hated human nature by reason of his suffering. About the middle came the lot of Atalanta. She, seeing the great fame of an athlete, was unable to resist the temptation, and after her there followed the soul of Epius, the son of Panopius, passing into the nature of a woman cunning in the arts. Far among the last who chose, the soul of the jester, Theracites, was putting on the form of a monkey. There came also the soul of Odysseus, having yet to make a choice, and his lot happened to be the last of them all. Now the recollection of former tolls had disenchanted him of ambition, and he went about for a considerable time in search of the life of a private man who had no cares. He had some difficulty in finding this, which was lying about and had been neglected by everybody else. And when he saw it, he said that he would have done it had his lot been first instead of last, and that he was delighted to have it. And not only did men pass into animals, but I must also mention that there were animals tame and wild who also changed into other and into corresponding human natures. The good into the gentle, and the evil into the savage, in all sorts of combinations. All the souls had now chosen their lives, and they went in the order of their choice to Lachesis, who sent with them the daimon, whom they had severally chosen, to be the guardian of their lives and the fulfiller of the choice. This daimon led the souls first to Clotho, and drew them with the revolution of the spindle impelled by her other hand, thus ratifying the destiny of each. And then, when they were fastened to this, carried them to Atropos, who spun the threads and made them irreversible, whence without turning round they passed beneath the throne of necessity. And when they had all passed, they marched in on a scorched heat to the plain of forgetfulness, which was a barren waste destitute of trees and greenery. And then, towards evening, they encamped by the river of unmindfulness, whose water no vessel can hold. Of this they were all obliged to drink a certain quantity, and, who were not saved by wisdom, drank more than was necessary, and each one, as he drank, forgot all things. Now, after they had gone to rest, about the middle of the night, there was a thunderstorm and an earthquake, and then, in an instant, they were driven upwards in all manner of ways to their birth, like stars shooting. Air himself was hindered from drinking the water, but in what manner or by what means he returned to the body, he could not say. Only, in the morning, awakening suddenly, he found himself lying on the pyre. And thus, Glaucon, the tale has been saved, and has not perished, and will save us, if we are obedient to the word spoken, and we shall pass safely over the river of forgetfulness, and our soul will not be defiled. Wherefore my counsel is that we hold fast ever to the heavenly way, and follow after justice and virtue always, considering that the soul is immortal and able to endure every sort of good and every sort of evil. 
Thus shall we live dear to one another, and to the gods, both while remaining here, and when, like conquerors in the games who go round to gather gifts, we receive our reward. And it shall be well with us both in this life, and in the pilgrimage of a thousand years, 